I'm Melissa Case from Hat to Hem, and today I am finally revealing my historical Disney costume. The character I chose was Lady from Lady and the Tramp. I chose her for three reasons. The first is I genuinely love the movie. Honestly, I really enjoyed both versions. I love the bygone era time period. I love how the angles were purposely kept low to really feel like it was being told from a dog's point of view. I love the vibe you get from the setting. Disneyland opened one month after this movie was released, and you can definitely see how both Main Street USA and this movie were inspired by a romanticized version of Walt Disney's hometown of Marceline. The second reason was it fits well with where I am in my life right now. We have a one and a half golden retriever named Maisie, who was the absolute center of our lives for over a year before we had a baby. Now, they're both the center because our world is bigger. Going through the life changes of getting a puppy, then having a baby, made the movie matter even more to me. Because I can relate to it in a special way because I'm at this point in my life. And let's face it, it's not like I'm going to show up in an enchanted castle or turn into a llama or magically have a gown made for me, even though that would be amazing, but here we are. The last most honest and most ridiculous reason is because of Maisie. My dog loves the live action version of Lady and the Tramp. And I mean, loves it. She actively watches it. She's not usually a TV dog, but this is her movie. It's appropriate because Lady is the reason why she has a blue collar, but still. <laughs> That's right. I've tried other live action dog movies. She didn't care about them. Not even 101 Dalmatians. Lady and the Tramp just speaks to her. Once, she barked at me for pausing it. True story. That happened. Oh well, we all have our quirks, right? Maybe it helped prepare her for when we brought our baby home. Or maybe she just likes seeing other dogs on screen and has a crush on the tramp. Who knows? Anyway, once I had my character, I had to make my design. I did make a video about my design inspirations while painting the watercolor. I'll post that video below along with the video where I use an Edwardian proportions chart to make the undergarments for this dress. I chose my colors first, taking inspiration from Lady's character design. I wanted to highlight her red ears with large sleeves, and I wanted her skirt to reflect her two-tone coat. I was lucky enough to find fabrics that fit the vague idea I had in mind. I knew I wanted it to look like it would fit within the Lady in a Tramp world, but I had no concrete design until I looked through Women's Fashions of the Early 1900s, which is a republication of a catalog from 1909. I'll link that below. Ultimately, I was able to put together the look I wanted. By the way, this little inspiration board was made for my petticoat tier patron on Patreon, but if you want your own copy, I'll post a link below. We're less than 10 minutes into this video and I've already made a lot of promises for links. The description's gonna get really full. Sorry. Oh, one last thing before we really get started. If you haven't watched my other videos, you may be wondering why I decided to make a half-scale costume instead of a full-scale one. Well, that's because I made the questionable decision to start this when I was nine months pregnant. I wanted to make this and this was the only way that was happening. Okay, now let me finally show you how I made it. So up first is the shirtwaist. I wanted that standard white lacy shirtwaist. The ones in the catalog were beautifully detailed and though I didn't have time for pin tucks and rows of insertion lace, I did find fabric that looks like it was made up of rows of lace. I also cut a strip of it to put where the yoke and the rest of the shirt would meet. I also took some time to cut out a decorative motif for the center front that wasn't originally part of my design, but that's just how it goes. You never know when changing direction will feel right. I draped the yoke on the dress form, adding tucks to each side. You can't really see them, but I know they're there. I filled with it until I found a height I liked. I also popped on the motif to make sure it worked. Bit big, but fine. I flipped the makeshift insertion lace up and pinned it in place to make sure it would stay exactly where I wanted it when I stitched it down. Once that was done, I ran a basting stitch to hold the tucks I made in place. 
Next, I attached the motif. If I had more time, I might have done this by hand, but I really wanted to get moving, so machine it is. The bottom half of the makeshift insertion lace was attached to a rectangle of fabric I gathered at the top and had run gathering stitches along the bottom for later. I stitched it together and cut off the excess fabric. This is also when I attached the bottom of the motif. I pulled the gathering threads at the bottom and the front of the shirtwaist was done! Luckily the back was a little bit less involved. I draped one half of it directly on the dress form. Then I used it to cut out a second back panel. I finished off the center with a normal hem. For the sake of time and sanity, I decided not to put in buttons or hooks and eyes. The dress form will be fine if it's just pin closed. I didn't stitch the side seams yet, and you'll see why soon. Onto the sleeves. Using the Edwardian table of proportionate measures, I found that the sleeves should be 18 inches long, so 9 inches at half scale. I was able to confirm this with my tape measure. That sounds official, I just pretended it was an arm. I was also able to see that the cuffs should be 9 inches around, so I cut out 5 inch rectangles to be the cuffs with seam allowance. I found a sleeve pattern I liked in Francis Gimbel's The Voice of Fashion. Again, link below. This next part took some math. Full disclosure, I don't know if this was the correct way of doing this, or even the most efficient. Since I had to dig deep down to find some middle school math memories, I'm gonna say probably it wasn't the most efficient or the correct way of doing this, but it worked for me and maybe it'll work for you. It just takes a while because you have to pretty much calculate every section of the sleeve. I started with the information I knew. I knew I wanted the sleeve to be nine inches long from the underarm. I knew it was currently two and a quarter inches long at that point. I also knew the widest width was currently three and a quarter inches. I used the butterfly technique to multiply nine by 3.25. I then divided 29.5 by 2.25. That got me 13, so the widest width of the sleeve would be 13 inches. After doing the same thing for all the widest and narrowest parts of the sleeve, I had a pattern. I ran gathering stitches along the top and bottom of the sleeve and gathered the bottom to fit into the little cuffs I made. I matched the ends and center of the bottom of the sleeve and the cuff to make sure the gathers were evenly proportioned. The top of the sleeve was attached to the armhole, a task that was pretty easy since I left the side seam unsewn. The sides of the sleeves were then sewn together and I continued right down and sewed the sides of the bodice together too. This technique doesn't always work, but when it does, it's so satisfying. The cuffs were finished off and the sleeves were complete. Once again, using the butterfly method, I was able to draft a collar for the shirtwaist. I marked the center front of the collar and bodice neckline, matched the pins, and pinned the rest of the collar on working towards the edges. The collar was stitched on and the top edge was finished with a simple hem. The last step was adding the waistband. The back of the bodice was pinned to it flat and the front was gathered up. Once that was on, the shirtwaist was pinned closed and it was done. This was the piece I was most nervous about. I had never made sleeves like this before and I'm very pleased with how they look. The front of the bodice was made a little longer than normal to give the shirt waist that classic Edwardian pigeon breast look. I think there's some fit issues with the collar, but the necklace, a blue ribbon with a pendant, disguises that a bit. Now up next was the skirt. I had originally planned to drape it, but draping skirts is just not my area, especially since I wanted a specific shape. Turning to the Victorian dressmaker, I was able to find a front panel that would work. I don't remember how I figured out that angle. I just remember I did this part pretty late at night. I eyeballed the angle for the bottom and I kept my line clean with a French curve. With my paper front panel in place, I was able to drape the back panel of the skirt. I trimmed the bottom to where I wanted it, and then I measured up a few inches and cut away more to fit my vision of the two-tone skirt. Then I finally got to cut into the skirt fabrics. The original idea for a skirt like this came from Truly Victorian's flared skirt pattern, and I think I did a good job mimicking it. Assembling it was pretty straightforward. Nothing like using white thread on brown fabric to show how tired I was making this. I liked the shape, but I thought it was a bit flimsy, so I took the three panels apart and flatlined them with muslin to give it a little bit more stability. If I was functioning at full capacity, I would have done this already, but I'm not and I didn't. I know I shouldn't push myself if I don't feel up to it, but sewing stabilizes and centers me. It makes me feel refreshed. 
Sewing is my version of self-care more than anything else, so getting any time to do it just feels like a gift. Anyway, while I was rambling, Passmel worked on the tan band that would go between the brown and striped fabrics. Because the proportions of the contrasting fabric were a little off, I made the bands thicker than I originally intended. I think it still works. My original plan was to just slip stitch the bands on, but then I found this trim and I thought it would highlight the pointed part of the band, so I cut it in half and painstakingly sewed it on by hand. After a few days of work, it became clear there was a problem. The only thing holding the trim together was how it was woven. So when I cut it, parts began to unravel whenever anything disturbed them. As nice as some parts looked, others looked less nice, and I didn't have enough trim to replace the unraveled sections. So it was back to the drawing board. I found a similar trim and I was able to attach it by machine. I don't like it quite as much as the other, but it got the job done. I was even able to just cover up the old trim so I didn't have to take everything apart. I can't complain. If you made it this far in the video, thank you. You lasted longer than my battery did. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you did make it this far, thank you. And let me know you did by going down to the comments and telling me either who your favorite Disney character is or who you would like to do a historical version of. If that's something you would ever be interested in or if you haven't already, because I know a lot of people have already done this. I finished the bottom of the skirt with bias tape, which I pressed up and attached with a slip stitch, catching only the lining so the stitches wouldn't be seen from the front. I attached decorative buttons near the point of the tan skirt trim. I also inserted a placket into the skirt, which I failed to get any footage of. Sorry. I played with the back pleats until I was happy with them. The waistband was attached, and the skirt was done. So now the two main pieces of the ensemble were complete, it was time for the accessories. Starting with the belt. I took new measurements and cut out a rectangle that I shaped a bit before putting on my dress form, where I shaped it a bit more. I'm not sure I would have gone with this color if it wasn't based on Lady, but I really like having that less literal nod to her collar. It's also fun having an unexpected pop of color. I cut out a second piece, sewed them together at the top and bottom, and clipped the curves. Then I worked on the slow task of turning it right side out. Every time I have to turn something inside out, it just takes forever. Once that was done, I set up the ends by hand. Again, I couldn't be bothered sewing closures, so I pinned it on. Once it was done, I was really glad I went for the blue for the belt. One piece left, onto the bolero. I found a basic shape in turn of the century fashion patterns and tailoring techniques. Rather than attempt to draft it and out of a desire to not do any more math, I drew the bolero, pinning and cutting away the fabric until it was close to the picture. I have time, so let's do a quick Disney history lesson. In the late 30s, Joe Grant, a character designer and story artist for Walt Disney Animation, penned a story about his Springer Spaniel named Lady feeling replaced by his baby's arrival. Walt Disney felt the story needed a little more and it was put on a shelf. Then World War II forced Disney to shift away from costly pictures until they made a little picture called Cinderella. Lady was revisited after a story about a cynical dog appeared in a Cosmopolitan magazine. The author, Ward Green, wrote the novelization of Lady and the Tramp, and the film was made in 1955, with Lady being changed to a Cocker Spaniel. Now what about that story about Walt Disney giving his wife a puppy in a hat box? Well, no one knows if that story is true or just a clever piece of marketing. Either way, it makes for some good lore. Okay, back to sewing. The bolero was cut out of fashion fabric and the lining. I didn't originally have a lining plan, but I had enough striped fabric to get away with using it, so I figured, why not? The side seams were sewn, pressed flat, pressed open, and then pressed from the correct side. The lining was then attached to the fashion fabric, right sides together, along the full outer edge of the bolero and along the back neckline. After being pressed flat, the outer seam was pressed open before the whole thing was turned right side out.
The edge needed a little convincing to lay properly, but we got there in the end. Once all the edges were pressed, the shoulder straps were sewn up, finishing the fashion fabric and the lining at the same time. The trim was then clipped on before being attached by machine. The width of the sleeves were determined by how much trim I had. I was pretty lucky because they ended up being a decent size. The sleeve fabric and lining were clumsily cut out since I was just too eager to finish this last step. That resulted in the edges needing to be cleaned up a bit, proving that you should just do it the right way the first time. Trim was attached and then the sleeve was sewn up. Just the fashion fabric was clipped onto the armhole and stitched on, with the lining of the sleeve being pulled away and the camera, unhelpfully, being pulled back even further. The lining was slip stitched down and finally, 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 the whole ensemble was finished. I am so happy with how this turned out. I don't often come up with original designs and to have one turn out how I imagined was so satisfying. A special thanks to my patrons for their support and encouragement on my numerous progress updates on Patreon, and thank you to you for watching this! If you enjoyed this, please consider liking, commenting, and sharing this video. If you really enjoyed it, please consider subscribing because I have some fun content planned. So, hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye! Disneyland opened one month after this movie was released, and you can definitely see how both Main Street USA and this movie were inspired by a romanticized version of Walt Disney's hometown of Marceline. Wow, that's a long sentence. Oh my goodness, I need to use more periods. Or at least commas. All right, deep breath. I'm sorry, this intro is getting really long. The person I spend the most time with every day is only four months old, and not the best conversationalist. I'm a talker and I am starved for adult conversation, even if that means talking to a camera. You can tell I'm talking a lot, I just have to replace my battery. With the paper front, with the paper front panel in place. With the paper front panel in place. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. I hate tongue twisters. Once that was done, I ran a basting stitch. Oh, I already did that part.